Thinking aloud. Conversations on the leading edge of knowledge and discovery with psychologist Jeffrey Mishlove. Hello and welcome. I'm Jeffrey Mishlove. Our topic today is the mind and its brain. My guest is Dr. Nicholas Rouleau, who is an assistant professor at Algoma University in Canada. He is a neuroscientist as well as a biomedical engineer. This interview was recorded in a hotel room in Las Vegas, Nevada, where both of us were attending the awards ceremony of the Bigelow Institute essay competition. And now, I will switch over to that video. I gather you did your doctoral research with Michael Persinger. That's at, right. At Laurentian University, who is very famous for his God helmet. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, he's. Uh, it was an incredible opportunity. I was actually born in Sudbury, mm -hmm. Ontario, uh, where Laurentian University is. So I guess it was... Um, written or something. <laughs> destiny. <laughs> yeah, destiny, sure. And your focus has been the brain and the relationship between consciousness and the brain, which is probably the single biggest mystery in all of science. No doubt, yeah. It's, uh, it's something, it's a topic that great thinkers always gravitate toward, you know, like um, if you look at scientists who end up winning Nobel Prizes, they, they tend to drop whatever, whatever it is that they're doing and gravitate over to consciousness research. Um, Roger Penrose, um, who else? Francis Crick. Francis Crick, yeah. There, there are all sorts of examples. John Eccles, mm -hmm. n another example. Uh, so I think it's just a, it's one of those problems that people who like to solve problems tend to move towards over time. Well, you've been uh, working at it extensively now for many years. Yeah. I, well, I started my uh, doctoral research with Dr. Persinger looking at the idea that consciousness could be a passive property of the brain. Um, the idea that perhaps there wasn't, th the brain expressed antenna like properties. And this wouldn't negate the past 100 years of neurobiological research, um, where we've defined things like the action potential and looked at different areas of the brain and how they process information, but it would be uh, a minor addition to that in the sense that we'd be finding a new signaling modality. Mm -hmm. And that's not truly uncommon. I mean, if you look at over the past 20 years, we've, we've added um, another signaling modality to uh, basic brain neurophysiology. We, we used to think that um, brains only communicated by synapses or by gap junctions, either uh, electrical or chemical um, signals, but now we know that they communicate by effaptic uh, junctions, um, also known as effaptic coupling, where the electric fields of cells beside each other will actually influence each other. And so, in fact, there are many more uh, and perhaps orders more uh, connections between cells in the brain than we assumed. There are basically two different models of consciousness in the brain. Either the brain produces consciousness, creates consciousness, or the brain acts as, as you say, as an antenna. It receives consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. So the, the, the standard neurobiological model is that the brain is a productive organ. It generates cognition, it generates consciousness, and everything about consciousness can be reduced to information processing at the level of the brain. And I find that very appealing from a um, physicalism uh, perspective. I think that there's, uh, it, it, it's highly tractable from the scientific perspective. Um, and yet there's so much, there are so many phenomena that aren't explained by the productive model. And so as you say, there, there's this, this other model, which is the transmissive model. And it was, it's been around in many forms over the past, well, over human history, really. Um, but the, the, the modern version was articulated very well by William James, uh, where he described consciousness as analogous to color 
uh, being sifted by a prism. Like the prism doesn't generate color. It simply uh, uh, filters light uh, into a spectrum of color that already existed in the first place. And in that same way, consciousness may be a signal or any kind of uh, property around us that is received by the brain, interpreted by it, transmuted by it, filtered by it, whatever word you want to use. Um, the mechanisms are still uncharacterized, but uh, this, could, this is a, a likely possibility. What I'm kind of hearing in your language is a, a dualist model, like there's consciousness here and the brain here, that somehow they're, they're distinct from each other. As opposed, for example, to the idealist model, which would say that actually the, the brain exists within consciousness. Sure. I, I mean, it's, it's difficult to... It's, it's always difficult to get in under consciousness. I tend to take the approach of, well, what can we measure? And with consciousness, neuroscientists, and, and my background is primarily in neuroscience, we tend to uh, get really concerned with neural correlates of consciousness, which uh, even the name implies that you're never really touching consciousness directly. It's always an inference. Um, and so I tend to go wherever the measurements take me. So even when I was doing my PhD research with postmortem brains, trying to see if brain tissue itself, even if it wasn't alive, um, could filter electromagnetic signals or electrical current and filtered in such a way where we could actually detect neural correlates of consciousness in deceased brain tissue, but brain tissue with the same cytoarchitecture that our brains have sitting here right now. Um, that type of approach, it seems to me, would be a way to get at dualism without really abandoning the possibility of being able to measure the thing, whatever the thing is. Now, I know that dualism is uh, popular among some uh, neuroscientists. Uh, Wilder Penfield, I think, a great Canadian researcher, uh, was a dualist. Sir John Eccles became a dualist. Uh, John Beloff in parapsychology became a dualist. Uh, so it's it's a popular view. And in fact, I understand, I think it's probably true, the average person on the street, if you were to talk to them, would probably be a dualist. I, I don't want to be accused of being part of the majority. I, 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 always, I, I always find that uh, whatever the consensus is, we should, we should probably move away from that uh, in, in general. Um, but no, I, I agree. I mean, uh, John Eccles proposed that perhaps there was a fundamental particle uh, called the psychon that uh, interacted with our brains and, and could potentially interact with a field of consciousness that exists outside of the brain. There are all sorts of models um, that I think converge on the idea that the brain is interacting with something, not necessarily producing it. I, I don't think that that necessarily suggests that the brain isn't producing anything. I, I do think that the brain does process information mm -hmm. in the standard way that we assume using regular uh, neurophysiology, uh, but I do think that there's something on top of that or in parallel to it. Well, a computer can process information, very sophisticated information, without any consciousness whatsoever. Sure. So there's a real distinction between mind activity and consciousness. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's, you know, even, even the, the, uh, the great Hans Berger who invented EEG, um, he was a, a, a great example of a person who was looking for, um, a signal outside of the brain that could potentially unite people, could potentially act as a means of communication between people separated at a distance, and would explain all sorts of phenomena like telepathy and remote viewing and all these psychical phenomena that have been marginalized by the scientific community who have unilaterally adopted the idea that the brain, the productive model of the brain, is the only game uh, in town. Uh, I think that's a mistake. Uh, I, I, I don't think that we should uh, have any kind of unilateral position. I think as sciences that um, eschew alternative hypotheses are usually doing so out of um, a kind of defensive reaction. Uh, and so 
being open-minded and, and trying to uh, bring in alternative models, I think is always a great idea. You know, I began our conversation by referencing the God helmet that uh, your faculty advisor in your dissertation work, Michael Persinger, was famous for. Let's talk about that for a moment. Happy to. Dr. Persinger um, invented uh, with his co-creator, uh, Stanley Corin, a helmet that when placed on the heads of subjects um, in a darkened room for about 45 minutes um, would produce these extraordinary experiences that were not explained by simple uh, suggestion. So um, the, the helmet was constructed in a very specific way. Um, solenoids, which produce magnetic fields when you run current through them, were positioned over the temporal lobes, so just over each, each temporal lobe. And you could control whether the field was on or off, what kind of pattern was used um, to stimulate the temporal lobes. and a certain configuration of uh, pattern stimulation produced these out-of-body experiences and sensed presence uh, where individuals sitting in the room would claim that a person was in the room with them when in fact we know that no one was there. Now the interesting thing was that um, some people would attribute the sensed presence to a deity and the deity was always uh, described as a character within the cultural belief system of the individual. And so uh, if you were Muslim, you would say that uh, Muhammad was there. If you were Christian, you would say that Jesus was there. If you were Hindu, you might say that Shiva or, or some equivalent uh, deity was there. And so the idea was that the temporal lobes are highly sensitive. We've known this since the time of Wilder Penfield um, and before that, really. Uh, but with Dr. Persinger's work, we identified that these mystical experiences could be generated by stimulating the temporal lobes. And then the question is, well, what kinds of natural phenomena give rise to the same types of experiences? Because of course we can do it in the lab, but what kinds of natural experiences generate it? And what kinds of meaningful, life-altering events um, have occurred throughout history to, to really change the, the, um, the progress of civilization? And I, I suppose there are some cases of epileptics who report similar experiences when they have uh, temporal lobe epileptic fits. Yeah, absolutely. It's been well known for, 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 for quite some time that temporal lobe epilepsy um, is associated with increased religiosity um, and, and a number of other symptoms. Uh, uh, the, one of the disorders is called Geschwin syndrome, which is... Uh, Characterized by hyper religiosity, tangential speech. So these individuals will go on, uh, these incredible, uh, orations where they'll switch from topic to topic in this beautiful and elegant and poetic way. And, uh, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, it's been happening for a long time and neurologists have been aware of it for, for quite some time. It would cause many people, I suppose, to say, well, this shows that the brain produces consciousness if you modify the brain this way and consciousness changes. I say that's a great criticism. Um, however, there, um, the alternative is that by changing brain activity, you change the way that the brain interacts with whatever signal is occurring outside of the brain. Um, now you might ask, well, what is that signal? And the, based upon Dr. Persinger's work, um, I inferred that perhaps the, 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 the fact that individuals can be stimulated by electromagnetic fields and have these incredible transcendental experiences um, could suggest that the same type of stimulus in natural settings could produce incredible experiences in the same way. So what would that be? Well, we know that the Earth generates an electromagnetic field. Um, it has a defined uh, oscillation to it, which is based upon the number of lightning strikes that occur globally uh, per unit time. And so we have this 7.8 hertz standing wave uh, associated with the Earth's magnetic field, and it overlaps tremendously with brain activity. We've known this ever since the discovery of that Schumann resonance, the 7.8 hertz that's, that defines the, the, the Earth's magnetic field's um, uh, oscillation. And in recent years, we've identified that people's brain activity coheres with 
Schumann resonance in real time. So there really is a connection between brain activity and the Earth's magnetic field. It's typically within the alpha and theta bands in terms of oscillation. Um, and those are the classic bands associated with meditation, tr uh, trance-like states, uh, certain kinds of sleep states. So there's all sorts of potential to unify concepts and phenomena that have been really not paid attention to under a new model of how the brain works. Now, as I recall, Michael Persinger popularized the phrase temporal lobe lability <laughs> as uh, indicative of people who report spontaneous paranormal experiences. Yeah, absolutely. And he would talk about it often. And uh, temporal lobe lability describes the tendency for some individuals to have a sort of sub-threshold um, activation level for their, their for their temporal lobe activity. And the temporal lobes, they, they do so many things. I mean, um, the temporal lobes are responsible for hearing and for components of speech and for um, facial, um, facial detection, the detection of color, uh, fear, um, sex drive, all sorts of things. And so if you have excess uh, activity within the temporal lobes, you can really generate all sorts of phenomenal experiences. And it, and it was Wilder Penfield and Pierre Gluer at McGill University who identified all of these incredible experiences that people can have when you stimulate different parts of the temporal lobe with um, a probe during surgery. And uh, yeah, it's, 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 it's incredible. Again, it would suggest a, a direct one-to-one -one correlation somehow between consciousness and the brain. Uh, you know, since we brought up Wilder Penfield, the great Canadian neuroscientist, I have heard conflicting reports about his research, and I wonder if you can clarify this for me. Mm. He was famous for electrical stimulation of the brain that would produce certain memories. You stimulate the brain, the person would have memories. Now, I have heard some reports that say if you stimulate the same area or position of the brain twice, you won't get the same memory each time. Hmm. And I've heard other reports that say just the opposite. You stimulate the same place and you get the same memory each time. And I'm confused. Which is it? That's a great question. Uh the, the storage of memories is not located to one specific place. We don't store memory in a particular area of the brain. And so it, it's, it's very unlikely that stimulating any one neuron or any group of neurons will produce the same memory over and over again. I'm not familiar with, ex with an experiment that is exactly like that from Dr. Penfield's. Now, uh, that's probably just me not being fully familiar with the uh, breadth of his work. The vast literature of yeah. the field is just... And probably every day there must be dozens, if not hundreds, of articles published. Absolutely. And, but I would say that uh, stimulating any one part of the brain will very likely produce different memories yeah. every time. Because memories are distributed isotropically, uh, almost like a hologram. Every memory that you have is distributed over the surface area of your brain um, in a kind of uh, series of points uh, at all the different synapses that are involved with that type of experience. We know this from Carl Ashley's experiments where he um, systematically ablated uh, different areas of the brain in animals and found that the more brain matter you got rid of, the more brain matter was damaged, uh, the less memory the, the animal had. Um, but it, it was proportional to the amount being damaged, not where the damage was occurring. So we store our memories everywhere in our brains. One of, one of the issues that I've often found fascinating is the distinction between the brain stem and the midbrain and, and the cortex of the brain in terms of consciousness itself. I'm under the impression that maybe basic alertness, basic awareness resides or is somehow correlated more with the brain stem than with the cortex. Yeah, absolutely. And and we know from experiments with cats, for example, that if you damage the periaqueductal gray, which is an area surrounding the cerebral aqueduct in the brainstem, if you damage that area, cats will lose consciousness. Now, that's not to say that the periaqueductal gray is the seat of consciousness. 
Uh, it's unclear that any one area is the seat of consciousness in that way, but it may be a necessary condition for consciousness. Not sufficient, but necessary. Um, the cortex seems to be much more uh, involved with phenomenal experience, and that's not to say that we can't get, um, get by without a cortex. Um, certainly, you can live without a cortex. Um, there are even reports of individuals who can navigate in 3D space using visual modalities without a visual cortex. That is, they can, they're effectively blind, but they can move around objects in the room because their lower brain centers are also uh, detecting and perceiving in some rudimentary way the world around them. And I'm also very puzzled by the near-death experience, people who have cardiac arrest, no oxygen coming into the brain at all. Uh, sometimes they're pronounced clinically dead, but then they can be revived. Right. And uh, often have very vivid memories of a situation uh, that they were apparently experiencing when there was no brain activity. Well, the, there's so much to say about this topic. So th the first thing I would say is um, at the moment of death, well, and, and you know, the moment of death is something to, to talk about in the first place. Yeah. I don't think there is a moment. Mm -hmm. I think it really is a process and it takes many uh, hours uh, for, it, for it to occur uh, because all of the, the brain cells need to actually slowly uh, become less active and ultimately die before there's no possibility of experience. So when people claim that they've died, usually it's in reference to cardiac arrest. Usually it's not in reference to the brain completely shutting down. And so many near-death experiences are exactly that. They're, they're experiences that the brain is having, genuine experiences, uh, but are associated with the brain slowly shutting down. And so um, experiences like the classic tunnel that all cultures report, the light at the end of the tunnel. This can be readily explained by activity within the occipital lobe and temporal lobe and the differential between them because as one area loses blood supply, the peripheral vision will be lost before the central vision. And so people are left with what looks like a pinhole and will be interpreted as a, as a tunnel. And because the tunnel is often lined with people on either side of you from, from your life, that suggests involvement of the ventral temporal lobe, which is involved with facial recognition. And so the, the brain is going through this incredible dance at the end of life, uh, a global activation state where all sorts of experiences are emerging and they're meaningful. It doesn't make them any less meaningful. And, the, and certainly they have to do with your life. Um, but are they experiences of death? I don't think they're experiences of death. I think they're experiences of life, but near death. Well, you use the phrase that the brain has experiences. That does imply a physicalist model that the brain is even capable of having experiences rather than consciousness. Sure. Yeah. So, yeah. I, I, I'm, I think that it's, it's difficult to, it's difficult to use the nomenclature that we are that we've already established because all of that nomenclature is is based upon the assumption of a uh, productive model. But when we're talking about a transmissive model, we don't have any of the nomenclature established. First of all, and second, if the two are not, if 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 they're not mutually exclusive, if in fact they can work together, mm -hmm. then we will have to generate a whole new set of, of words to describe these, these phenomena. Yeah. They're certainly a problem with language. Yeah. Here and, and culture. Yeah. We, we are embedded in a culture which is basically materialist. Certainly the academic culture. True. Let me ask you about the Hameroff Penrose theory of consciousness. I've done many interviews with Stuart Hameroff and his notion that consciousness per se is produced by some sort of quantum wave functions going on within the microtubule structures of, of the uh, neurons themselves, very, very tiny uh, structures. Uh, how does that sit with the neuroscience community? Oh, how does it sit with the community? Well, I would say that uh, we shouldn't look to the neuroscience community for any kind of uh, for, for a uh, uh, 
a, a sign of where things should go or what's true. Yeah. Um, but, but I do think that the, the neuroscience community does in fact think that, um, other models are more explanatory. Um, now what do I think? I, I, I think that it's an, it's a fantastic model. I think that focusing in on the cytoskeleton and looking at, uh, computations that are subcellular is something that isn't being taken seriously, but should be taken seriously because it, it would explain the inordinate, um, complexity to, uh, the computations and information processing capability of the brain. Um, the work of other scientists like Jack Tuzinski, uh, who've looked at, uh, microtubules within electric fields and how they, how they will, um, become changed by those electric fields and how they interact with them, um, suggests that there is a possibility that we compute some, some amount of brain activity subcellularly. And if that's true, um, we're talking about many orders of magnitude, more computational power inside the brain. And if the brain has, uh, 10, 20 billion neurons, um, and each has, you know, several thousand, uh, connections, um, we're talking about maybe 10 to the 14th potential connections. And each one of those could be a, a zero or a one at any given moment. But if we're talking about microtubules, now we're talking about orders and orders of magnitude more of these computations because they would occur at the level of individual proteins. Maybe 10 to the 500th power or something like that. Yeah, I'm not sure what the number would be, but it would be, it would be huge, I, incomprehensible. I have heard it suggested that there are more potential connections in the brain, not even counting the microtubules, actually, just, just looking at synapses, I think, uh, because a single neuron might have a thousand synapses that... Um, the, the possible connections existing within the brain is, is a larger number than the number of subatomic particles in the entire universe. It's, it's possible because, look, the, the, the standard model here is that we're looking at, when we talk about connections, we're talking about two neurons being very close to each other, sending each other electrical or chemical signals. But with the discovery of a faptic coupling, now we're talking about every single cell, not only being interconnected with thousands or tens of thousands of other cells, but they're, they, there's a potential for synchrony between neurons that are adjacent to one another over large scales, over individual neurons and groups of neurons, but also over the course of networks and, and circuits. And what that would mean is that every neuron has the potential to affect every other neuron. And the combinations are, are truly endless. So, yeah, I, the number would be massive. And, and what we're suggesting here, and I think it's one of the big problems, I, I have heard it expressed as the binding problem in, in neuroscience. is like, how do all these neurons work together to create coherent consciousness and personality that a human being experiences? It's, it's suggested that there might be quantum correlations going on. Yeah, and, and that was an area that uh, Dr. Persinger was really fascinated with, the potential for different uh, areas of the brain to communicate with each other in this way, but also for brains separated at a distance to communicate with one another. Um, and this invokes uh, quantum phenomena like entanglement. And this the suggestion from physicists is usually that this is not possible because it violates uh, thermodyn th thermodynamic principles. Um, Effectively, yes, uh, entanglement exists, but over large distances at a macro scale, it's not possible. And yet, there are experiments that have been that have been uh, reported in the past twenty years that experimentally demonstrate that you can get coherent activations of brains over distance in space, and it can be facilitated using uh, electromagnetic fields. Now, I know that parapsychological data is largely ignored in the neuroscience community, but Dr. Persinger was an exception in, in that regard. Uh, how, how is it looked at today? How is it looked at today? I would say that the, uh, it's not looking very good. <laughs> the, uh, the, the neuroscientific community does typically uh, not look at parapsychological findings as, as being um, uh, credible. It's usually dismissed on the face of it. 
uh, often they're not familiar with the actual studies or what was done experimentally. There's no question of what the controls were or how many um, participants were in the study. It's really just, oh, um, a matter of uh, pr pr it's prejudice is what mm -hmm. it is, is what it is. Um, and to some degree, I can, I can understand this. And the reason I can understand it is because if you have a model of the brain that is productive, none of these phenomena make much sense. If, if brain activity really is private in the way that neurobiologists on average assume it is, then discussing things like telepathy and remote viewing and psychokinesis, these are non-starters. Um, so I completely understand that. It makes a lot of sense. It's logically consistent. I would expect it. Mm -hmm. But if we start to consider these alternative modalities, neuroscientists will have to read the literature. They're going to have to look at all of these other phenomena that currently aren't subsumed under the model of productive consciousness. Which is something that Persinger did, and I assume something you do. Yeah. I mean, Dr. Persinger, a lot more than me, well, he had a lot more time than, than I've had so far. Uh, but yeah, he, he, he definitely looked at uh, these kinds of phenomena. Um, in my research, I am approaching the problem of consciousness from a different perspective. I'm trying to build miniaturized, customizable uh, brain tissues in a dish and seeing if we can re reverse engineer cognition. And cognition would involve consciousness as, as one of the, um, one of the, the pieces of the puzzle. Um, but yes, D D Dr. Persinger did, um, in fact, st study that, um, extensively. When you say cognition would involve consciousness, it's tricky again because you, you get computers who can emulate human cognition without consciousness. Mm -hmm. And, and I would imagine one would see the, the same thing in, in biological tissue in a test tube. Yes, e exactly. And the philosophers have done a great job of describing all of the problems with this. Um, and, and the, phil the philosophical problems really describe the hurdles that must be overcome. So I would say that if, if we did have a tissue that seemed as if it was conscious on, on the basis of uh, measuring neural correlates, um, we would have to equip it with the means of reporting its own consciousness. I mean, the only way that you and I know that others are conscious, or at least the way that we infer others are conscious, are, is on the basis of verbal self-report or inference on the basis of behavior. And so when, when we want to know whether a brain a disembodied brain in a dish is conscious, um, we're going to have a lot of trouble unless we give it a body. It needs to have some sort of body, something to use as a reporter, some sort of effector, be it muscle tissue or a robotic body, it doesn't have to be organic, um, to somehow report its conscious state. Um, I don't know exactly what that would look like right now. I'm working on it. That's, that's part of my research program, but uh, I think that it's, uh, there's a bright future for that sort of thing. Well, I know that I'm conscious. I, I can yes. only infer that you are conscious because you seem a lot like me. Yes. Right. And, and, and uh, Descartes was right when he, he noticed that that is the, that is the ground truth. The ground truth is that we introspect and we, we realize that we are experiencing and everything else is up for debate. Everything else is subject to illusion. And so, uh, the the possibility that even someone who looks a lot like me or talks a lot like me or behaves a lot like me is conscious, um, that can't be accepted on the face of it. We, there's no real evidence for it. It's really a guess. Yeah. Um, I would say that it's a useful guess mm -hmm. and it's gotten us by uh, pretty well as a species for a long time. You know, a theory of mind tends to be pretty useful, um, but I don't think that it's sufficient to make the claim that others are conscious. Um it's just a piece of the puzzle. It's a one piece of evidence towards yeah. the conclusion. Well, we're here in Las Vegas today, and, and we're together because you submitted an, an award-winning essay to the Bigelow uh, competition uh, about evidence for survival after death. And uh, you largely based your argument upon your own neuroscience research. So uh, l let's talk about that. Where, how do you develop your argument concerning survival. Sure. And by the way, congratulations to you too <laughs> for, you. For, for, for your award-winning essay. Um, yes, I, uh, I construct my argument from really, I, I, I start from William James's original formulation of the problem. Faced with the question of 
whether consciousness could exist after death, uh, William James suggested that the brain has to work in a very specific way in order for that to occur. The brain has to have this transmissive property that, we're that we were talking about earlier, which is that it must filter consciousness or receive it or in some way interact with it, but not necessarily generate it. And in that way, consciousness would exist before the brain existed in the first place and after the brain existed, so after death. So I start from that kind of foundation or framework. And then for the rest of the essay, really all I'm doing is curating the past hundred years plus of scientific data that suggests that the brain does potentially have this alternative function, this passive property. And I do cite a bit of my own research, my PhD research specifically, where I used human postmortem brain tissues. These are the brains of humans uh, that have died, obviously, and their brains have been preserved in a chemical fixative, which keeps all of the cells exactly where they were upon death. Um, there's still all the incredible cytoarchitecture. They're all connected in this beautiful way. All of the networks still exist. All the circuits still exist, but it's just not functional. There's no, there's no action potentials. The neurotransmitters aren't being shuffled from cell to cell. And what I did was uh, I took these tissues and under the premise that brain tissue itself could potentially, uh, like an antenna, pick up or receive extra cerebral signals that might be associated with consciousness, I started to expose these postmortem tissues to different kinds of electrical stimuli, either direct current, running current directly through the tissue, or exposing the tissue to an electromagnetic field. And what I found was that different parts of the brain filter electromagnetic fields and current differently. And there's a, a particular part of the brain that seems to filter electromagnetic um, fields in a way that's unique compared to others. And that's the parahippocampal gyrus, specifically in the right hemisphere, at least according to my own findings. Uh, but there, there is an amplification of theta waves or, um, seven to, uh, uh, in, in the range of seven hertz, it, it, it can also go into the, to the alpha range. So around seven to 10 hertz. Uh, there's an amplification of those frequencies in that area of the brain. And that's consistent with some of the research that's been coming out in the past couple years um, that has demonstrated that brains will um, cohere with Schumann resonance. Mm -hmm. um, and that suggests that there is a kind of connection between the brain and S signals within that frequency range. So that was, that was my research and, and I thought that was pretty interesting. The other thing that I found sort of by accident was that over the course of several years of running these experiments, I had a lot of control conditions where I didn't do anything to the brain. I just measured, um, uh, electrical potentials, just voltage over the surface of the brain. And you do get fluctuations and it's basically noise, but that noise is ordered in some way. Um, it's, it's, it's ordered by the Earth's magnetic field, but also uh, magnetic fields in the environment from electronics and things like this. You have to be careful about how you do the experiments. But what I found was that retrospectively, if I went and looked at the control brains and, and, and correlated the oscillations that were occurring within the control brains with whatever the geomagnetic field was doing on the day in terms of the amount of uh, flux density, uh, there was a clear relationship between geomagnetic storms caused by perturbations of the sun um, and uh, these microvolt fluctuations in the tissues. So there really was a connection between the tissue and Earth's magnetic field even after death. Um, so yeah, that, 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 that's, that was the, the basic argument in the essay. Well, what I would derive from your research is that we are intimately connected with our environment, with the subtle aspects of our environment that we normally don't pay attention to. Absolutely. People have been saying this for a long time. Even, even um, mostly Eastern cultures have been um, discussing the idea of everything being unified. And I think uh, a, a fair, um, a fair-minded physicist would, would agree with this, which is that everything is in fact connected by the fundamental forces. Um, and so to find out that it even happens on a local scale is, I think, almost comparatively mundane. I mean, we're all connected, no doubt, um, but we're connected over 
over um, reaches of space and time that that seem to uh, transcend our own perceptions. So we normally have a, a view of the human being that sort of it stops at the skin. Yeah. And your work would suggest that even even a, I guess the word would be necrotic, even a dead brain is, is still registering uh, connections with the uh, distant aspects of the environment, uh, perhaps changes in solar storm activity. Right, uh, absolutely. And if if someone's uncomfortable with this idea, I would refer them to the literature that discusses the the oscillation of the electromagnetic field of the heart outside of the body. You can detect heartbeats from several feet outside of the body. Oh, yeah. And um, you know, it doesn't have to be spooky. This is this is not uh, you know, it doesn't have to be sci-fi or anything like that. If we just talk about a simple pump and I, I don't want to reduce the heart to a simple pump, but if you talk about a heart versus the brain, you start to get the idea that, yes, in fact, even our internal organs are responding to the, to, to the world in this way and, in fact, influencing the world. Um, in what ways? I think that we don't have a great idea because very few people are actually researching this. But uh, I think that the, uh, the, the frontiers are, are, are ready to be explored. Well, Nicholas Rulo, this has been a enlightening conversation. We could probably continue for a long, long time because it'll take decades, maybe centuries to solve some of the problems that you're working on. But it seems as if you're uh, an open-minded young researcher with a big career ahead of you asking the really important questions in science. Thank you so much for being with me. Thank you, Jeffrey. And for those of you watching or listening, thank you for being with us.